girlfriend in high school, and you know, before I start the story, let's just say, it sort of ends up being a gigantic media event. Um, his girlfriend in high school, she's a uh, Romanian, her name was Karina. Good girl, kind of slutty, I kind of like that about her. And you know, I had just graduated high school, actually, I wasn't even in high school, I was like, maybe a couple weeks after I graduated, and I was like a virgin, it was like fucking pathetic, it was really like, driving me crazy. I mean, you gotta understand, this was back in like 85, where like, Nancy Reagan was just saying no, and everybody had AIDS, and people were afraid of sex, and you know, I felt totally robbed, I mean, I still do, I still like, just see the resentment, because, you know, prior to that, with my brother is in the late 70s, I just figured my entire life was going to be strobe lights and, you know, blowjobs with girls with feathered hair and dolphin shorts. It just never panned out that way. The country got conservative and took me by surprise. It still does. So anyways, Karina was this, like, girl from Transylvania who, you know, was just out there wild, buck-ass crazy. And I would hang out with her. She pulled me out of the blue with these weird little things. So one night, maybe a couple months after I graduated high school, I was, you know, preparing to move to New York, which is part of the story. Uh, she calls me up and tells me that she needs a ride to this party. Now, she was like 15 at the time, so I'm like imagining this junior high school party, right? So I pick her up, and she takes me up Sunset Plaza to what was, at the time, this famous place that I had never heard of. We found that out for a fact. It's like this Alpine chalet, this like A-frame shaped house that was like the last vestige of 70s Hollywood swingers. And this is the night I found out that my high school sweetheart, 15-year-old Karina, was a prostitute, and I was taking her to a trick. Her guy that she was tricking with was some guy named Jerry, and this Russian girl with her name Basha, who was like fucking hot, but just like had no emotion. I mean, like, the eyes of a hermit crab, you know, there was like no humanity there, like this perfect body with like black eyes that had no expression at all. I start like fooling around with the Russian girl, who's like, hot, you know what I mean? I don't even remember fucking her. Like, I only found out a couple days later, actually, the cheap penetration. I wasn't quite sure. I didn't know if it counted or not. Leave it at that. I was, you know, up and down in a second, completely, like, alienated. Like, lying there, watching my high school sweetheart fucking this guy who's, like, 60 years old and looks every day at it. She's blowing him, like, right in front of me. And she crawls up to me, the Korean, the Romanian girl, crawls up to me. Like this little worm, like this little earthworm, like crawls up to my chest. Spits the guy's cum all over my face. And that's when I discovered what the paper towel wrap is for. Um, got up, ran out of there as quickly as I could, got my clothes on, took off, ran down the street, hopped in my car, drove back down to Sunset. You know, around Fountain and Highland, I just sat in the car and parked and like fucking wept. It was like awful. Really alienating. But right around the time, like, you know, being a writer, right around the time I decided, decided that as awful as it was, it was, you know, good fodder for literary expression. So I started writing these sex stories that, you know, were the, where the thing went horribly wrong, you know, they called it literature or neurotica, you know, like erotics for neurotics. Um, I was writing these weird sex stories. It really fucked me up. And then I moved out to New York. So I'm out to New York and I'm telling everybody the story of like this girl spitting cup on my face to everybody who listened to it. And I met this guy named Peter Cooper who used to be a foreign correspondent, used to cover wars, he had these great stories. He lived in New York, he'd be a great subject to interview with. Tell him the story. His wife used to work for Interview Magazine. She was friends with Pat Hackett, who was Andy Warhol's ghostwriter. So lo and behold, I'm being interviewed by Pat Hackett for an Andy Warhol book about this orgy story. And I tell them the whole story, just like I told you guys, you know, the coming, the whole thing. Um, weirdly enough, John Waters was at the same table, told me that's called snowballing. I remember that being kind of memorable. Peter and John went to high school together. Um, and then, like, uh, thought nothing of it for a couple months while I was, like, kind of struggling around New York, like, hanging out in the shark bar where they filmed the Pope of Greenwich Village, kind of living in Soho, like, with, on no money. It was, you know, pretty amazing, because it was the 80s where everything cost a fortune. And then I get this call to have this photo shoot in Interview Magazine with Warhol. <laughs> so, like, I show up there, you know, like, based on this orgy story, I, I take a couple pictures with Warhol in the office of Interview Magazine. It was, like, not even professional. It was, like, some instamatic film camera. And, you know, he goes, I'm Andy. And I'm like, I'm Reed. I'm the orgy boy of Hollywood. And he goes like, 
Oh, that's interesting. A couple months later, Warhol dies. A couple months after that, the book comes out. It's called the Andy Warhol Party Book, right? It's all these famous people telling stories of like wild parties they went to, you know, kind of like what we're doing now, but a book version. I'm at City Cafe on La Brea for the absolute vodka sponsored book party of the Andy Warhol Party Book. Word soon gets out that I'm the only one with like basically an interesting story in the book. I got a hundred people lined up at this table. I'm signing autographs all night long based on my virginity being lost. I got a couple of copies of the book, showed it to my parents for posterity. You know, the parents thought it was a horrible thing that happened to me, but they were glad I could capitalize on it in the typical Hollywood fashion. And then for like five or six years afterwards, I was on the A-list for any sort of event that occurred in New York or LA. I was automatically on the guest list of getting into anything. It sort of made me, you know, um, you know, it was kind of a funny little thing. It was sort of my entry into like high society was the fact that I got, you know, some guy's jism skewed on me at a Hollywood orgy. It's kind of where my life kind of took off into these kind of like weird experiences that I've always wanted. You know, as a writer, you kind of want experiences, but I don't know, man. Something about experiences, like, I'm beginning to think now at my age that, that you know, the more experiences you have, the closer you get to total disenchantment, you know, with everything. It's like, you're no longer proud of them to become the sort of, you know, burden, you know, that you work towards, and you never quite get out of it because you become sort of like this experience junkie where even the experiences don't make you high anymore, but you gotta have more of them, but they don't really do anything. You know, I'll start out the story and I, I keep on wondering if like, if I didn't take that phone call, if I didn't like the slutty girl, if I didn't go up to that orgy, if I didn't follow people into the room, that my life might have taken a, a pretty dramatic course to the point where like, I could be doing something else in my life than sitting here at 43 chain smoking in a bar in the middle of the night, telling stories that happened to me at 85.